These are the notes on nuclear fusion. We're going to be discussing nuclear reactions, or at least many of them, that are very critical for understanding chemistry. So why are they so critical? Because they relate to the nucleus. Notice that the word nuclear is just an adjective form of the word nucleus, which of course is the center of an atom. It turns out that the only time that an element can change is in a nuclear process. And some people call these processes nuclear reactions. Uh, it depends, sometimes the word reaction is, is reserved for the more dramatic ones, but these are all nuclear processes. I'm just gonna refer to them as nuclear reactions. What do I mean by elements changing? What I mean is changing from one element to another, like from carbon to nitrogen, or changing the isotope is also a nuclear process. So changing from, let's say, carbon 13 to carbon 12, that is also a nuclear change. So now we can see that there are actually three different, fundamentally different kinds of changes that can occur. We've already talked about physical changes and chemical changes. Remember that a physical change is when you change the shape of something or the phase, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas. A chemical change is when you actually change the chemical, change the chemical formula. Now we have a nuclear change at the bottom. A nuclear change is when the element or the isotope changes. For now, we're gonna talk mostly about the elements themselves, and then we'll get into the isotopes. And you can think of an isotope as being kind of a different flavor of the same element. It would be the same element with a different mass, and we'll get into that shortly, but not in these notes. Quick review, subatomic particles. Well, honestly, if you go into quantum physics um, and you study all the different particles that are now known to exist, it gets kind of hairy, kind of complicated, okay? But for the most part, we can still understand most chemical processes by sticking with the fundamental three subatomic particles. Now it turns out that the protons and neutrons are made of even smaller particles called quarks. A proton is two ups and a down quark, and a neutron is two downs and an up quark most of the time. And, you know, we could go into that, but it's not necessary for understanding things at a high school level. So we are gonna stick with your traditional three subatomic particles, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. These are your everyday pieces of matter that make up the world around us. As you should know, an electron is negatively charged and a proton is positively charged. Pro, positive, if you're for something, you're very positive, right? And then there's the neutron, it is neutral, okay? Neutral means no charge, they're free, no charge. So we're gonna be discussing these particles and how they interact. Just remember that of course, the electron is negative, the proton is positive, and the neutron has no charge at all. Now, what you may have been led to believe in earlier classes is that one of these particles is of particular importance, that one of them rises above the others. But it's often my experience that students are given the impression that that would be the electron. I'm not saying electrons aren't important. Electrons are very important. However, if you really get down to which one is the most important, it is decidedly the proton. In fact, if you want to know which element you are talking about, the only thing you need to know is how many protons does it have? If it has one proton, then it's element number one, atomic number one, atomic number one hydrogen. If it has two protons, atomic number two, helium. If it has three, atomic number three, lithium. We could have really just called them element one, element two, element three, if we really wanted to make things simple. 
And what are we talking about with that number, the atomic number? The most important number, protons. So I want to leave no room for doubt. And please remember this. Protons are fundamental, and they are the most important particle, at least to determining what elements you have. And then, well, electrons get involved later, and they are also, they also have a great significance. I'm not playing them down. Okay. And then neutrons, what do they do? Well, they kind of stick things together, and they add mass. So let's see how these particles interact with each other. Remember that there are four fundamental forces that we know of in the universe. Everybody knows about gravity. Well, gravity is our perception of warp space. You could get into that. But as you know, gravity pulls things together. It only pulls together. It never pushes apart. Electromagnetism, on the other hand, is the one we're going to be talking about the most. That is the one that holds atoms together. In other words, it keeps the electrons going around the protons, going around the nucleus. But when you are down deep inside the nucleus, it turns out there are some other forces that you are probably less familiar with, the strong force and the weak force that are involved. And just like they sound, one is much stronger than the other and one is much weaker. In fact, the strong force is the strongest of all the forces and the weak force is the weakest of all, just like it sounds. However, they only operate on a very, very short distance. They only operate on a very, very minute uh, reference frame. So we only really need to worry about them when we are deep, deep down in the nucleus of an atom. Beyond that, they seem to have very little effect on pretty much anything. But they are important when it comes to nuclear chemistry because it focuses on the nucleus. So remember with, this is called Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's Law is in that little yellow equation right there. Well, it's written in green on a yellow background. F equals, and you multiply the two charges together times a constant, divided by R squared, which would be the distance between them, squared. So this is an equation for calculating how much electrical attraction or repulsion occurs between any two objects. So first of all, qualitatively, just in terms of words, just remember that opposite charges attract. A negative and a positive, they're opposites, right? They will pull each other together. And then like charges repel. Like two negatives, they will push apart. And two positives, they will push apart. So Coulomb's law really measures the force that they push on each other with, okay? So you can calculate it using Coulomb's law. And notice that force weakens rapidly with distance. This is called the inverse square law because notice R is in the denominator, it's on the bottom, and R is squared. That means if you get a little bit further away, it drops off dramatically. If you get twice as far away, it drops off with the square of two, which is four, it divides by four. If you get 10 times further away, it drops off with the square of 10, 10 squared is 100, so divide it by 100, that's 1% as much. So electrostatic forces really drop off dramatically with distance, so they are far, far more important when you get down deep inside of an atom where there are tiny little distances where these forces are very strong. But we can observe these on the macroscopic scale with things like compasses and magnets. We can still observe these forces, even on a big macroscopic scale but where they are even more, tremendously more important, is way down deep inside the atom. So as I said, the proton is the most important particle. I'm just gonna say that, I know it's controversial. Because if you know how many protons you have, you know which element you have. So look right here, what element is this? All that, there is, all that you see there is a proton, but that is an element. Which element is that? What did I tell you? Oh yeah, count the protons. Well, there's one, and you know the atomic number. That's element one, that's hydrogen. This actually is considered hydrogen already, one proton. Okay. So what's gonna happen with bigger elements? Well, you're gonna need more protons, so they're gonna have to stick together. But let's look at what happens 
when two protons approach each other. Let's look what happens. Two protons approaching. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? Because they are like charges. Like charges repel. Funny, then why do they stick together in every other nucleus of every single element other than hydrogen? Why do you have more than one proton? Hey, that's weird. Maybe you never thought of that before. Interesting, right? Let's keep going. Then we've got the neutron. Well, neutrons are neutral. They have no charge. So what's gonna happen if two neutrons pass near each other? Hmm. Oh, by the way, I should mention that neutrons in many ways are similar to protons. They're about the same size. They're about the same mass. They're very similar to protons. They're just kind of missing the charge. Okay, let's keep going. Two neutrons, what are they gonna do? Passing like ships in the night. Now, neutrons actually very rarely do this because actually neutrons don't last very long. You might be surprised to find out that as far as we know, protons last forever, okay? Electrons seem to last forever, but neutrons don't. Neutrons will last, oh, how long do you think? What would you guess? Like a million years, a thousand years, what would you guess? Well, you're gonna be surprised that neutrons on their own, outside of a nucleus, last 15 minutes. Neutrons only stick around, on average, about 15 minutes. Some of them a little less than that, some of them a little more than that, but they don't last long. So it's actually very unlikely to get two neutrons whizzing by each other in almost any scenario. Even places that produce them, okay, you're very unlikely to have them just randomly pass by each other. But it can theoretically happen, and so that's what I just showed there. Interesting, right? Then we've got the buzzy little electron. I'm showing the electron moving because you just can't keep those guys down. You can't keep electrons standing still. They, they always have to be moving. Sometimes we think about electrons in terms of a wave function. We think of them as bouncing around, making sort of like a wave. But we're not gonna get into that right now. Let's just talk about an electron as a particle for now. And of course, it has exactly the opposite charge of the proton, a negative charge. However, it has very, very little mass. It is a very, very lightweight, not even featherweight, okay, micro featherweight competitor here. Electrons, bloop, it's a little bloop of mass. They need mass because if they didn't have that mass to tether them to space time, well, they would shoot off at the speed of light and then you wouldn't really have too many atoms, would you? So electrons, it's a good thing they have at least a tiny little bit of mass. But what they really are known for is their negative charge. They're so negative. Two electrons? Well, of course they repel, right? Uh, because like charges repel. Two negatives repel each other. That's obvious. But wait a second. Doesn't every atom larger than hydrogen have two or more electrons going around it? Which is kind of weird now that you think about it because shouldn't they all be like pushing each other away, get away from me because of this force? Interesting, interesting. And yes, in fact, they do. This is gonna be a critical thing for understanding the shapes of molecules as well as the shapes inside of atoms when we talk about electron configurations. Interesting, right? So let's try another one. A neutron and an electron, nothing's gonna happen. Why? Well, they're not, this, they're not like charges, are they? but they're also not opposite charges. So because the neutron has no charge, it can never be an opposite charge. It can also never be a like charge unless you're talking about another neutron. So it does not, and, and those do not attract by the way, so they defy the rule if you wanna think of it that way. Um, so electrons are obviously not attracted to neutrons and it doesn't matter anyway because those neutrons are only gonna be around for 15 minutes. What they wanna find is something more stable, something with a more positive outlook on the world. Oh, maybe a proton. Ah, there we go. And this, of course, is the combination that we're familiar with. A proton with an electron sort of whizzing around it, and sometimes it's represented in different ways, and you might scoff and say, oh, Mr. Pemble, this is such a cartoony version of an atom. Look how big you've made the proton and how you've made the electron. That's just silly.
kind of like a cartoon. But actually, do you know what? Any representation that you have ever seen of an atom, no matter how accurate it attempts to be, has always been cartoony, incorrect. Sometimes they might play themselves off like they're not, trying to look very technical. But in fact, if you wanted to show an atom to the proper scale where you could even see the electrons, the proton would become invisible. It would be so small you wouldn't see it. Smaller than a smallest speck you could make with a pencil on a paper. So you've actually never really seen a true atom. And yes, I will admit this one is cartoony. And the way the electron is buzzing around, it doesn't really stop like that. I'm just trying to make sure that you look, that you see it. Um, it's buzzing around in what they call the first energy level, which is kind of like a clouded space, like sort of a volume around the nucleus where that electron is going to be somewhere inside, kind of like a moth around a fire, much more like that than the moon around the earth or the earth around the sun. Not neat like a planet, but more all over the place, like a buzzing moth. Okay, so that is what we call an atom of, guess which element? Hydrogen. Now, how would you know that? Well, because I said count the protons. If you count the protons, there's only one, element one, hydrogen. But something can happen to that hydrogen. This can happen. The hydrogen can lose its electron. Now it is what is called ionized hydrogen. And of course, it's still hydrogen because it still has the proton. But where'd the electron go? It lost it. So now it has a charge, which is what ionized means. Interesting. This is going to come into play in a little bit. Just hang in there. But there's a few combinations we did not talk about. Oh yeah, what would happen if a proton and a neutron were to come together? We didn't talk about that one. Let's try that. So here comes a proton and a neutron. What's going to happen? Hey, wait a second. That's surprising. Because according to electromagnetic attraction and repulsion, Coulomb's law, that shouldn't really happen, should it? Because positive and no charge, they aren't opposites, they aren't like charges, they should neither repel nor attract. But it turns out if a proton and a neutron wind up close enough together, something else kicks in. But before we get to that, let's just let me just ask you something. What element would this be? Remember what we said about counting, remember what we said about counting the protons? So what element would this one be? This would be hydrogen, right? Hydrogen, because if it has one proton, then it's always hydrogen. So what is holding these together? What is holding these together is in fact, so what is holding those two particles together? that proton and that neutron? Well, it's certainly not gravity. They don't have much mass. That is minimal. Electromagnetism doesn't attract them or repel them. It's a wash. It is actually the strong force that holds those two together. And we are going to find out that the strong force is responsible for holding together all the nuclei except for hydrogen one. And we'll get to the weak force a little bit later. That's another one that's involved in the nucleus. But the strong force is the one that holds the proton to the neutron. So the strong force not only holds protons to neutrons, it can actually hold protons to other protons, which seems to defy Coulomb's law. Electromagnetically, they should repel each other, but the strong force actually attracts them. So as long as there's a neutron around to stick to as well, the strong force can bind a nucleus of two protons together as long as there's at least one other neutron available. Okay, so you can sort of think of the neutrons as enabling any large nucleus to hold together. Um, you really need one for any two protons to stick because otherwise, why would they? Why would two protons stick together when they're both positive and like charges repel. So the funny thing is that even in a nucleus where two protons are together, they are still pushing on each other. They are still repelling each other. There's still repulsion. 
And without those neutrons, which are now stable, when they're in a nucleus, they become stable to hold them together, then they would fly apart. So how can we measure the strong force? We will get to this later. You could sort of think of it as being a little bit of an overlap between the neighboring particles, that some of the mass is converted into energy. We'll get to that later, called the binding energy. That's one way of thinking about how the strong force operates. But again, the strong force only operates if you're incredibly close together on the order of one proton diameter or one neutron diameter. If you're much beyond that, it's actually a very minimal force. So it's strong over extremely short distances. How about this one? Well, this, of course, will stick as well, right? For the same reason. Um, what element would this be? Hmm. Oh, yeah, one proton, element one, hydrogen. So this is called hydrogen three because it has three particles in the nucleus, okay? But it's still considered hydrogen, right? Um, now, these are what we call isotopes. So there's hydrogen one, hydrogen two, and hydrogen three. That's a great example of three isotopes. We'll get more into isotopes a little later, okay? Um, but remember that all of them have one proton. So regardless of which of these isotopes of hydrogen you have, they are all going to pull in one electron. So here again is hydrogen one, which is really just a proton with an electron going around it. That's an atom of hydrogen, cartoony style. And we already talked about how that hydrogen can lose that electron. And if it loses it, well, now it is ionized. This is critical because if you are not ionized, well, then those electron, that electron, is sort of protecting the nucleus. It's buzzing around it, sort of like a force field around the nucleus, protecting it from bumping into anything. But if you remove that electron, now the nucleus is naked. The nucleus is exposed, and it can potentially come into contact with other objects, like other nuclei. This is critical, critical, critical for what we're about to talk about, and this is actually a different state of matter. The state of matter where the electrons are removed, you might not be familiar with this one. Okay, we've mentioned it before. It's not a solid. It's not a liquid. It's not a gas. What is it? It is plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. Plasma is found in all stars. It is formed when high temperature and high pressure strip electrons from a nucleus or just enough energy to do that. It turns out this is what makes fusion possible. These are the notes on fusion. You need plasma to have fusion. Plasma also will conduct electricity, and it is formed by lightning bolts in the Earth's atmosphere. That is one way that we observe plasma naturally forming here on Earth. A lot of plasma is off the Earth, out in space, in the stars, but we do get to see it occasionally, okay, when there is a bolt of lightning. Because a bolt of lightning is so energetic that it strips all the electrons off of the atoms of air, of nitrogen and oxygen. And that is our great example of plasma close at home. Although in Southern California, we don't get a lot of thunderstorms. We get about five a year on average. Almost anywhere else on land, gets more than we do, but we still get it occasionally. So that is an example of plasma. Now, why is plasma so important? I'm a big proponent of plasma awareness. You gotta know about it, because if you don't know about plasma, well, then you can't understand the following processes. Nuclear fusion is the big one. Nuclear fusion is the energy source for all stars. Now, we think of nuclear fusion in bombs. Well, some bombs, the hydrogen bomb, will get to the point where it produces nuclear fusion, okay? But the number one way to think about it is what is going on in stars. Why is this important at all to chemistry? Because this is how the elements formed that make up the periodic table. This is how 
all those elements formed. They formed by nuclear fusion. So this is the big one. This is the most important nuclear reaction to know about. So in the cycle of a star's life, it undergoes fusion ignition. Then it has fusion for most of its lifespan, making new elements. At the end of the star's life, it will somehow throw at least some of that material into space. The material in that nebula, that cloud that's going out now, will wind up in other stars and in planets. So by this process, elements are produced. These are the elements that we're studying in chemistry, okay? And our sun is a third generation star, so we have material that was produced by at least two earlier stars, probably many more than that that overlapped each other, but we have material that has been produced inside of at least several stars. What you just saw there is the simplest example of nuclear fusion. It is one of the ways that helium is formed. Notice right there, you can see that there are two protons now. Well, then that would be a nucleus of helium. We haven't seen that one yet. This is called helium-4 because it has four particles in the nucleus. We'll talk more about that later, what they're called. But this was formed out of two different varieties, two different isotopes of hydrogen that collided. Now, how can they collide? Well, keep in mind, the hydrogen can't normally collide. The nuclei of hydrogen are usually protected by the electron. So this can only happen when the electrons are stripped away and it is ionized. In other words, this can only happen in plasma. So stars need to be made of plasma in order for this to happen. Here it comes again, watch. And notice that a neutron was thrown out of there. There was an extra neutron and that's only gonna last about 15 minutes, right? So it doesn't make it too far from the sun. So we're relatively safe because neutrons are actually pretty dangerous. Um, and of course, some energy is released. Well, that amount of energy isn't super huge, but it happens with each one of these collisions. And if it happens millions of times per second, then of course the energy adds up. And that is the energy that heats up a star like our sun. Here's a schematic diagram. Now, technically, hydrogen-2 has its own name. It can be called deuteron, and hydrogen-3 can be called triton. Okay, so when they come together, well, there's an extra neutron there. It gets chucked out, and you wind up with a regular helium nucleus. Notice these are all very flattened, so you can see them all at once. Okay, so this process is occurring right now as we speak in the sun, day or night. It's happening in the sun, and that is the number one kind of fusion that heats up our star. Well, not quite, because actually those two varieties of hydrogen, the deuteron and the triton, are actually not that common. They're actually far, far less common than just regular old hydrogen one, which is really just a proton. So most nuclear fusion actually occurs starting with just a bunch of protons on their own, hydrogen one. But this one is a little more complex. So nuclear fusion is forming larger nuclei by combining smaller ones. This can only happen when you're in the state of plasma. And the way to remember this is fusion in the sun, like a crossword puzzle. Now, why can this only happen in plasma? Because otherwise the electrons which protect the nucleus that go around it, they would bump off of each other, never allowing the nuclei to come together. But even when the nuclei are not protected by electrons, it's still really hard to get them to fly together because they are like charges. They're all positive. Every nucleus has a positive charge of some kind. So you actually really have to drive them together like a pile driver or an atom smasher, okay, which is really what the sun is. The pressure inside the sun due to its gravity and um, all of this, the, the speed, the energy that all the particles are moving is what drives together these unprotected nuclei, allowing them to have nuclear fusion. And when they do come together, they stick. And again, that's an example of the strong force. And that energy is released and they become even more stable 
in, for example, helium. So again, two hydrogen combined to become one helium nuclear. Now, again, as I said before, this is not the most common way that it happens because typically hydrogen is really just a proton. The way that it really usually happens is what is called the proton-proton chain. We're starting off with four hydrogen-1 nuclei, and then through a series of changes, you're going to see they wind up becoming helium. Let's watch. Now we've got hydrogen-2. Now we've got helium-3. And finally, helium-4 which is the stable form of helium. That's the regular old helium that we find all around us. So that is actually the most common pathway of nuclear fusion in stars across the universe. Seems a little more complicated though, right? You can't just see it happen in one step and there's a lot of weird things involved there. For example, one of the things involved there is what is called a positron. Now, what is a positron? A positron is an antimatter version of an electron. So that seems weird, right? And then neutrinos, we don't usually get too deep into neutrinos in high school chemistry. And then of course, gamma rays, which are the most energetic forms of radiation. Gamma rays incidentally are also produced in lightning bolts um, and they are produced majorly inside stars, okay, from nuclear reactions. So this proton-proton chain is much harder to visualize, but just remember, even though it's hard to keep track of all these little changes happening, it's got several more steps. Basically, you're starting with hydrogen, you're ending up with helium. And this can only be accomplished if they are pile-drive together, pile-driven together, in the heart of a star by tremendous pressure to overcome their repulsion. Because still, remember, they would repel each other. Positives really do repel even under these extreme conditions. It's just sometimes they don't repel enough to stop the collision from happening. And that is when we get nuclear fusion, when they are driven together despite their repulsion. And then once they come together, well, then they stick using a strong force. And we'll talk more about that quantitatively later on. So nuclear fusion is how hydrogen is combined to make helium. But it's not just that, it's actually how all other elements are formed, okay? And all other elements are formed by nuclear fusion or in the energy of a supernova explosion, which is kind of like abnormal fusion. It's kind of like fusion that doesn't normally have enough energy to occur. But in any event, nuclear fusion is the primary process by which the elements on the periodic table are formed and of course, it's what heats up stars. It's a good thing we have a hot star out there providing most of the energy we use in our daily lives. Most of it comes from the sun. So there you go. There's not a lot of other parts of nuclear fusion that are very obvious to look at and easy to see visually, but I did find one other component which is so, so simple that you can visualize it yourself. This is called the CNO cycle, the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle and if you look at them they're adjacent to each other on the periodic table they're all in a row next to each other on the periodic table the only problem with this cycle is it is a cycle it actually goes back to the beginning again and well i'm not going to show that part what i'm going to show you is how it progresses from carbon to nitrogen to oxygen because that's a very easy thing to visualize each one of those gives off a whole bunch of energy Okay, and that's another kind of nuclear fusion that you find in stars. The only problem is we've got to start with carbon-13. Carbon-13 is not your regular everyday form of carbon. It's kind of an unusual isotope, but this is the one that is involved in this chain. So I'm going to start with carbon-13. Well, it turns out if you have carbon-13, a nucleus of carbon-13 in a star in the form of plasma, unprotected by any electrons around it, flying around at high velocity, I'm not showing that here, and if it runs into a proton, well then the proton sticks. And if the proton sticks, well, now you've got a different element. If you gain a proton, 
okay, you now have a different element. That's a nuclear reaction. Now you would have nitrogen 14. Well, guess what? That's what you're breathing. Nitrogen 14 is the regular everyday form of nitrogen, the most common isotope of nitrogen. And you're breathing it now. It's most of what is in your lungs, going through your nose and mouth right now. Okay, but another process can happen. It could be hit by another proton. Okay, again, still buzzing around, still unprotected by electrons. And, and then if you add another proton, well, doesn't that change the element? Yes, now we've got oxygen 15. Now, oxygen 15 is an unusual isotope of oxygen. It is not most of the oxygen that you're breathing. Okay, most of the oxygen you're breathing is oxygen 16, but this isotope is what is formed in this particular chain process. And then because it's a cycle, well, it can actually go back to carbon uh, 13. There's a whole cycle to this, but I'm not gonna show you that part. I just wanted to show you the simple part of it because honestly, there aren't that many parts of the nuclear fusion process that are uh, very, very visual and easy to see before your eyes. So I, I cherry picked this little section, hydrogen into helium, and then carbon into nitrogen into oxygen. But you've just got to realize by analogy that this is what happens with all of the elements building larger and larger as you go along. So it isn't just these particular ones. It's just these are the easy ones to see. So elements are produced in this way, going from hydrogen to helium and going on from there to carbon and going to nitrogen and oxygen and so on and so on, all the way along, producing more and more energy as they go along, heating up the star more and more as you go along until you reach a very critical point. And that is when you make element 26, which is the symbol is Fe, that is iron, okay, ferrum in Latin. So it turns out iron has an incredibly stable nucleus. It turns out it is the most stable nucleus, all right? So iron 56 has the most stable of all the nuclei on the periodic table. So stars will keep on fusing after iron. The only problem is every element it makes after iron, okay, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, produces less and less energy per nucleus. So the problem with that is stars are heated up by the power of nuclear fusion. And if that begins to decline, well, then the star will change its size. It will contract or sometimes even expand, or it'll oscillate, go smaller and then larger, which basically kills a star. So when a star, when a star begins to produce elements after iron, the star is already in its death throes. Okay, it's beginning a star's death. And this can take a long time because stars have very, very long lifespans. And we're talking about things over the orders of billions of years usually, or at least hundreds of millions of years. So when I say a star is dying, well, that can take a long time. Okay, luckily in the case of our sun, we do not expect anything like this to happen for at least the next four billion years, maybe even five billion years. So people are not too worried about it at this point. So you can think of iron as kind of like poison for a star. It's not poison for everybody. I mean, I guess you don't want to eat pure iron anyway. Um, just, yeah, but it's poison for stars. Um, once a star begins to make iron, that's sort of the end of the star's life. So the elements that are after iron on the periodic table, which is actually most of them, because iron is only number 26, elements go up to 118. So, all those elements are going to be much, much less abundant in our universe because most stars don't even make them. If, however, you have a very large nebula, which puts a lot of mass into the star, well, then you'll get a very, very hot star, like a blue giant. These stars burn up very quickly and they explode dramatically. Okay. Now, this is not the only way that supernovas can form. This is just the simplest way that they can form. In fact, there's even an even more common way that they can form from binary stars. But I'm showing this one because of its sheer simplicity. When a massive star explodes, well, in that moment of explosion, you have tremendous excess energy. So much energy is available that you can fuse things well beyond iron. No problem. Plenty of energy to fuse 
pretty much any element. So what you wind up with is a little bit of every other element after iron on the periodic table. Elements that we sometimes consider precious, like silver, gold, platinum, or other elements that we just don't come by very often, like mercury or tungsten, okay? And that's how they're produced. They're not produced in the regular life cycle of any star. They're only produced in the very brief period, probably about a week, a very, very short period. I mean, a week as opposed to like millions of years or billions of years. So that is why some of those elements are just so much scarcer or lower abundance than your everyday elements like hydrogen and carbon. Those are all over the place. And it has a lot to do with stars' life cycles. So remember, a supernova is the death of a massive star, okay? An exploding massive star that increases in brightness many thousands of times. So when a supernova is exploding, it turns out it is brighter than the entire galaxy that it is in. For just maybe a week, that one star outshines hundreds of billions of stars all at once. It's an amazing phenomenon. Now, these do not happen very often. They happen, you know, every millennium in each galaxy or something like that. Um, and the reason it's called a supernova is because when ancient people looked up in the sky and they saw a new star, they would call it a stella nova, which is a new star, okay? But um, then when they saw ones that were much brighter than that, they're like, well, what's brighter than a nova? I don't know, a supernova, okay? So it's kind of a, Etymologically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a super new star. I don't know, but it's actually a bigger explosion. And people don't give much attention to the nova explosions anymore. That's another kind of stellar explosion because they're not quite as dramatic. They're kind of the runners up. Kind of like nobody pays much attention to neutron stars because there are black holes, which are much more interesting and crazy, okay? So nobody pays much attention to a regular nova anymore because there is a supernova which is much more dramatic. By the way, the star Betelgeuse, which is Orion's, let's say if you're looking at him, his left shoulder, it's really his armpit, but whatever, um, is one of the stars we expect to go supernova sometime soon, you know, anytime now, in the next, you know, many thousand years. So of course, once the material is outside of the star, okay, once it's been ejected from the star, well, then, of course, it's going to pick up its electrons if it can. If there's any electrons around, it'll grab hold of them. And now it is no longer plasma. It'll be protected from the outside world by those electrons. Some nuclei are bigger. They have more protons. So they will, of course, attract more electrons. The number of electrons you attract is exactly the same as the number of protons you have because charges balance out. Nature doesn't like charges. Charges naturally balance each other out. So if you have a really, really massive, massive nucleus, well, now that's super, super protected by layers and layers of all those electrons. These are moving a little fast. I don't know if you can see all these crazy electrons buzzing around this nucleus, but it's very, very well protected, okay? However, the problem is that some very large nuclei are very, very unstable. They are just barely hanging together. Why would that be? Well, remember that every single one of those protons is pushing against every other one of those protons. They're all kind of pushing apart, like a coiled spring, a, swing, a spring that you've squeezed together and is ready to burst back open. What is stopping them from springing apart? It's actually the strong force. So remember, the strong force, which is linking the protons to the neutrons, and the neutrons to the other protons, and the protons to the protons, and the neutrons to the neutrons, that is just enough there to hold a nucleus together. But there is a limit. There is a point where the nucleus can no longer be adequately held together. And if you get beyond that point, well, maybe it'll hold together for a brief time, but then it will, of course, break apart. Now, this will happen regardless of whether it's protected by electrons or not. This is something that a nucleus will do to itself. It will break apart, okay? But if you don't wanna wait around for this to happen, there is a nifty way to trigger it. Well, it isn't that nifty 
because it's actually a very dangerous process. They realize that if you have a nucleus, it is possible to split that nucleus. If it's a large, unstable nucleus, it is possible to split the nucleus. When they say splitting the atom, it's really splitting the nucleus. And this is not fusion anymore, because remember, fusion is getting bigger. It is getting smaller, which is called fission. Now, unfortunately, these two names are very, very similar. Nuclear fusion with a U and one S, and nuclear fission with two S's and an I. Now, nuclear fission is not a particularly important process in chemistry, but I think it is important to be able to distinguish between these two, these two very, very different nuclear processes. These are the big ones. These are the F words in nuclear chemistry. Pardon my French. Okay, these are the, these are the big important nuclear reactions, the most dramatic ones. So what does fission look like? Well, again, like I said, you can just wait around and sometimes it'll happen spontaneously if you wait long enough, or it can be triggered. But what could trigger nuclear fission? Okay, if you have an unstable nucleus like uranium-235, which has 235 total particles in the nucleus, well, you're not going to get a proton anywhere near that because protons are going to be deflected by all the other protons that are in there, okay, like charges repel. What about electrons? Well, remember, I'm not showing them anymore, but there's electrons surrounding this, and that'll block any electrons from getting in there. So what's left? What's the other particle that might be able to hit that nucleus? Well, it turns out that particle is the neutron, and they discovered something that changed the world in the 1940s, that you could actually hit that nucleus with a neutron. And watch what happens. The nucleus splits apart into two smaller chunks. These would, of course, be different elements, cesium and rubidium, because they have a very different number of protons each. And then did you notice that three neutrons flew out of there? Well, when this process happens, you usually get either two or three neutrons flying out, depending on what the products of the fission are. So what they found was that those three neutrons could go on to collide with another nucleus. So if each of those three neutrons that are thrown out from the initial fission in the middle, if they actually collide with three other nuclei, and those nuclei, in fact, undergo fission, and they send out three more each, well, you can see where this is going. This is what leads to a fission chain reaction, and this is what was used in all the early nuclear bombs, okay? So this only happens when called critical mass, packing it really close together. This is a fission chain reaction, and as long as you have more neutrons that are being produced by the fission than what went in, then this is possible. One way to slow this down is by spreading the material out or putting obstacles in between so that not as many of them collide. And then you can have a sustained nuclear fission reaction like in a nuclear power plant. In any event, this is fission. So fission is splitting the atom when atoms are split into smaller elements. It's really the nucleus that is being split. And then of course, well, the electrons would go with the nucleus because they're attracted to the protons. And the earliest one that they were able to successfully do this with was uranium-235, which is an unusual isotope of uranium. And I know I've been dropping the word isotope a lot in these notes, but we're gonna get more into isotopes actually later on. That is not your regular everyday uranium, the most common, it's not the most common isotope of uranium. So sadly, nuclear fission, like a, a lot of advancements in science, led to some bad consequences. It led to the discovery of the nuclear bomb. The initial nuclear bomb was a fission bomb, and only later did they find out a way to take the initial fission and use that to trigger fusion. So there are bombs now that involve both of these F word nuclear processes. But for the most part, I think it's easier to think about nuclear bombs as being fission and think of stars as being fusion. So again, 
The way to remember it is that fusion happens in the sun. Think of like a crossword puzzle here, right? Crossword puzzle, fusion sun, because it has the U. Whereas fission, on the other hand, is division. Okay, fission is division, dividing, making it smaller, splitting the atom. And those are the two largest nuclear reactions, the two big ones, the F words in nuclear chemistry. Again, nuclear fusion forming larger nuclei by combining smaller ones. So remember, you're starting small, winding up larger, forming larger nuclei, fusion in the sun, Nuclear fission, with an I and two S's, is splitting a large unstable nucleus into smaller nuclei. Fission is division. This is what they mean when they say splitting the atom. And this is the other large nuclear process. Now, the other nuclear processes, the smaller ones, we will get to in the next notes. And those are the ones that are happening naturally, not under weird conditions like in a star or triggered by people in a nuclear bomb, but these are ones that are going on all around us all the time. This is what we call radioactive decay, and that's what we're getting into in the next notes. And that is the end of the notes on nuclear fusion.